morning. Getting ready here to start. It's nine o'clock. We um, will be in First John. I'm excited. I love First John. I love First John, chapter one, especially as a, a good little little chapter of ten verses. So, got a couple of people here this morning already. I'm sure others will be coming in. Appreciate you coming. Hopefully, you had a a blessed weekend. Went to church, got involved, helped other people, prayed with them. Always good things to do. We had a great time. We sent a couple of people from our church out to other churches, and I'm sure that they're going to be blessings as a minister over there. Excited about what God is doing here in our little community. Excited about our new little button, if I can share a little bit. Um, Patty's excited over there because she sees it on her screen. <laughs> But I requested a donation button for um, our church. Yes, we are Harupa Valley Christian Fellowship. Uh, long story short, that's what we originally started off as, was Harupa Valley Christian Fellowship. And then we became affiliated uh, with Calvary Chapel, probably about 10 to 14 years later. And we changed the name, doing business as Calvary Chapel Inland, but our business name is Harupa Valley Christian Fellowship. So. So I just thought that'd be cool to put on there. If anyone feels led to, to support uh, this uh, ministry, then you have that option. You know, prayerfully seek the Lord. And of course, always before, uh, before you do that, you always want to give to your home church and support the place that you fellowship and, and worship at, definitely. So, But let's grab our Bibles. <clears throat> let's open up to the book of... First John, it's at the end of your Bibles. If you have a Nelson <clears throat> open Bible, then it's on page 1283. <laughs> <clears throat> oh boy, I love this, uh, this little book. I'll just give you a little idea. Look at my Bible, it's all, it's all marked up. It's got so many markings uh, on that chapter. Um, just years of studying. <clears throat> But we'll make it simple uh, this morning as we share a couple of things. Let's go ahead and, and pray for this Monday morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day, uh, giving us uh, a new week to begin, Father. Give us strength and give us what we need, Lord, to begin this week, Father, as it's Monday morning. always seems to be a difficult day to start off. Lord, but you're gracious and you're good, Lord. We thank you for that grace that you have given to us, Lord, and for your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for his love and his compassion towards us, Lord, and that he is always so willing, Lord, to help us in times of need, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us, Lord. Minister to us now as we get into your word, as your people are here sitting. We want to pray, Lord, that you would invite others to come and join us uh, at 9 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Lord. Or, Lord, that you would just expand... Uh, Father, the, the views on Facebook, uh, Lord, and that it would reach out to even more people, Lord, uh, that have a hunger, Lord, to know the simple word of God, uh, Lord, and that uh, it would be shared many times, Father. Just your anointing, we're trusting in you, Lord, that it would be your work done, Father. Bless us now, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, Stephen. You're joining us on Facebook, huh? Instead of being here. We miss you, buddy. All right, let's open up our Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. Now, before we get started, just, just a quick little introduction so we understand the context, because context is always important in understanding the Bible, especially the context of history, when it was written and when it was recorded and who it was written to. And we saw that in Peter, right? How he's, he was ministering to the scattered church and then second peter to the actual church uh, that was established and there in, in that part of the area and ministering to them specifically in ephesians also with paul and so john here is dealing with a specific heresy that's going on <clears throat> and spreading in the church 
And so this letter really is written to refute that heresy that's, that's being um, uh, pushed onto the church. And that heresy is agnosticism, um, <clears throat> which basically teaches that, that matter really isn't there, that, that it's more of a spiritual thing, that Jesus was more spiritual than he was matter. And, and so they had different views on sin, on who Christ was, and so forth. And we'll deal with Christ because John will deal with Christ. Uh, but just backing up to sin, for instance, they felt that the body was sinful. It's matter, and it's what's sin. But God didn't look at the body, and it's sin. God looked at the spiritual man, who, which, who was holy and pure. So they began to teach that you could indulge in the flesh, you know, as long as God looked at the spirit and you needed to keep the spirit pure, then you were fine with the Lord. That was one of the errors. <clears throat> and then Jesus, <clears throat> when he resurrected, and the Jehovah Witnesses uh, took this doctrine also, uh, view of, of Jesus, that when he resurrected, he resurrected in a spiritual body, uh, not in a physical body. And now, if you read the Gospels and you look at the event where Jesus presented himself before Thomas. He actually told Thomas, touch me, touch the nail, you know, marks on my hands and in my side and so forth, just proving that it was a physical resurrection. Uh, but they, they missed that. <clears throat> so they believe that Jesus walked spiritually. You know, he could walk on sand, but you would see no footprints kind of kind of thing because everything was spiritual and they spiritualized everything, uh, keeping it separate from matter. So saying that, John writes to uh, repudiate that doctrine. <clears throat> so he starts off immediately in chapter 1, and it's almost like immediately he gets right to the point, and he describes his relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and read first four verses. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. I'll stop there for a second. So almost immediately, he, he just answers it right away, right? They say, Jesus, you can't handle. He's spiritual. But John immediately says, look, this, this is from the beginning, uh, which we heard. That, and he's speaking personally. We've heard Jesus. We, we heard his voice. He, he spoke to us. Uh, we have seen with our own eyes Jesus walking, talking, ministering, miracles, signs, wonders, uh, which we looked upon him. And then it says, we even handled him with our own hands concerning the word of life. Now, he goes back to what he wrote in the Gospels, chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word <clears throat> was God. And so, John is refuting that doctrine, saying that, no, Jesus was matter. He was in a physical body, and we handled him, we saw him, we heard him, and so no, that is false doctrine to believe otherwise. It's an ex it was an exciting time for John <clears throat> to, to even think about uh, how they walked with Jesus, how they talked with Jesus, and how they even handled, handled Jesus. That thought right there is kind of intriguing for me to think about <clears throat> sitting at supper with the Lord and you know, you, you, you give a brotherly hug to someone or you go over and shake their hands and things like that. But this must have been so special. I mean, to have God in the flesh sitting with you, pure love. You know, there was no hatred in him whatsoever. I mean, I am sure that there were times when he put his arms around them, maybe even put, allowed John to put his head on his chest, not just at the supper, but we see that happening at the supper. I, I, I would say, and be safe to say, that he probably did that before too. You know, and there have probably been times where Jesus just could, come here, John, and just hugged him close to his chest, you know, and say, I just love you. you know, I just love you, and just poured into those guys. It must have been a, you know, a real intimate, great time uh, to, to live and, and walk with Jesus. <clears throat> I remember when Modesto had called us <clears throat> and told us that uh, Gabby was on her way to being born. She's now going to be 18 this coming November. And we rushed over to Corona Regional Hospital, 
really quickly and she was born before we got there and we, we parked on the um, east side parking lot there and walked in through the, the doors and told them we needed to go to maternity and, and went there and there was Modesto and uh, his wife holding holding Gabby in, in their arms, you know, and just my heart just dropped and I, I took her in that swelling cloth, you know, and all, all reddish, dark haired and just I was in I was in total awe of um, of that moment, you know. It was like it was timeless, priceless, and it just seemed like time was going very slow to, to see that that experience with my granddaughter Gabby being born. And then and then my heart just dropped when we heard that she had a little heart murmur that it was skipping a little bit, you know, and so we got really concerned about it, and, you know, they assured us that she was fine, and she still has it. Uh, every once in a while, she, she tells me she can feel it in her, in her heart. I guess the, the beat just changes a little bit, you know, but I can imagine that experience <clears throat> being like John the Apostle and the other apostles with Jesus Christ, you know, that they seeing him, hearing him, touching him, you know, as he probably embraced them and, and loved all over them. It, it was special. But he's using that to refute this false doctrine. And then in verse 2, he says, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, if you're going to believe this false doctrine, then you're not having proper fellowship with God or with Jesus Christ because it's a different Jesus Christ. It's not the same Christ of the Bible. You're talking about a, a Jesus Christ that didn't have a physical body. Our Jesus Christ has a physical body. And so you can't have fellowship with a Christ that doesn't exist. Uh, that's hard to explain to people and for them to grasp. Just because you use the name Jesus Christ doesn't mean it's the same Jesus Christ of the Bible. <clears throat> I remember years ago they came out with a, a movie, and it was a, a, a heresy of a movie. It portrayed Jesus as having a relationship with Mary Magdalene. And I remember um, hearing some of the details and said, I'm not going to go see that, that, that movie. And um, there was an interview with a rabbi. <clears throat> the rabbi was talking about the movie, and when he was giving his opinion, the person said, have you seen the movie? And he said, no. <clears throat> so he said, you need to go see the movie before you can comment on it. So he went and he saw the movie, and he said the, the cross scene was spectacular. He said it was just amazing how they portrayed him on the cross. But as he was watching that and thinking about Jesus, his Savior, he thought, that's not the Jesus, my Savior of the Bible, though. That Jesus up there in this movie scene is, is a fornicator, first because he had laid with Mary Magdalene, and that's not the Jesus of the Bible. <clears throat> and so it's important that we understand that it's not just the name Jesus, but who is Jesus? Who is he, and who do men say that I am? is the question that he asked the disciples. Um, so John is making it very clear here, look, you don't have fellowship with Jesus unless you understand that Jesus had a physical body, that he resurrected from the dead in a physical body, and he ascended to the Father in heaven. Um, if you want fellowship with us, then you need to take that doctrine, that true doctrine, and embrace it. And he even goes on and says <clears throat> in verse 4, uh, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So God is light and there is no darkness. When Jesus enters into the room, darkness runs away. Darkness always runs away. If you have a dark room and you turn the light switch on, darkness escapes and the light illuminates. John is saying here, look, you can't have fellowship with God when you're living in darkness. 
when the light comes in, darkness will run, and that means you will probably run. So if you have that false doctrine in your life and that you feel that you can continue to sin and live in darkness, but your spiritual body's fine because, you know, it's the spiritual man that God looks at, he says, well, you're wrong. You can't have fellowship with Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Now, that's an interesting thought there in itself, that in Jesus Christ there is no darkness at all. There is no falsehood. There is no manipulation. Uh, there is no desire to hurt or to manipulate someone to do anything. He is pure light. And in fact, he doesn't even try to manipulate us into believing in him, which I find interesting. He gives us and presents to us the truth, and then he allows us to make that choice. Uh, he gives us plenty of evidence, if we were to take the time to look at the evidence, historical evidence, textual evidence, geological evidence. I mean, there's just so much evidence, just in the, the evidence of geography of Israel where it's at, and all the historical monuments that were there. Artifacts that have been found uh, from other nations that speak about a global flood. And I mean, there's just so much amazing evidence, but God in no way ever tries to force us to believe that. He's, he's definitely a perfect gentleman because he's light. He's completely light. And if we want fellowship with him, we can't continue uh, to practice walking in the light. And, and that has to be made clear because look at what he says in the next verse, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin so a couple of things you know if we are saying that we have fellowship with him and yet we're walking or practicing darkness then we lie some practical things if, if you're a, a constant habitual liar you know then you're not walking in the light if you're a constant habitual thief then you're not walking in the light. If you are, you know, today in our society, and it just, it's just so interesting, I see this so often. Uh, there was a, a young lady, <clears throat> just, uh, it seemed like a very powerful Christian. Uh, she had all the right words, she said they're all the right things, and I thought, wow, her, she's got a strong faith. And then she starts talking about her fiance. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna be getting married soon. I go, when are you gonna get married? Well. We've been engaged now for several years, and we're hoping to get married in a couple more years, and, and so forth. I, and so, you know, one thing led to another, and she says, you know, so we're just living together right now, and, you know, waiting for that time. I go, you're living together? And it's like, wow, that doesn't make any sense, because the Bible teaches otherwise, that you should wait to be married before you live with someone or consummate the marriage. You know, and so forth. So you can have all the right things, but if you're practicing, and then, by the way, that's called fornication. It's not adultery, unless he's married, <laughs> but it's fornication, and it's what the Bible says we shouldn't be practicing, uh, living, cohabitating, uh, significant other, whatever you want to call it, it's sin. And God says if you walk in that type of sin, you're in darkness, no matter how much you know about God. And, and James is very clear the devils believe, but they fear and they tremble, right? because they know that they're not living for God's purposes. And so he's saying, be careful, because if you're walking in darkness, you don't have fellowship with God, nor do you have fellowship with us. How can you have fellowship with believers? You really can't have true fellowship with believers when you're walking in sin. That's why it's important to, um, to walk rightly before the Lord. For our ministry, we have a questionnaire. Anytime you start serving, there's a questionnaire. And one of the questions on the questionnaire is, are, do you live a holy life? And, and we're not saying, do you live a perfect life? But are you striving to live for God? Are you in a relationship? Are you living with someone is, is another question too on there. Because we want to know. And, and, and if they are, then we will go to them and say, you need to correct this. You need to either move out or go to the courthouse and just get married. And then do it the right way. And then you can... Uh, begin to serve, but if you don't change that, you can't serve here. Uh, how, can, how can darkness have fellowship with light? How can you have fellowship with believers well, when you're living in that type of sin? You, you just can't do it. There was a, um, well, I won't share that. <clears throat> it's another church.
<clears throat> and so he, he's very clear here. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. And he goes on in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Again, you know, they're Gnostics. And so God doesn't see the flesh. He's seen the spirit. So we have no sin. And John says, no, you are sinning. And if you say you have no sin, uh, if you say you have no sin, then you're just deceiving yourselves. And the truth is not in you. But he also says in verse 9, this is, this is the, the hope that we have. You know, sin brings guilt, obviously, right? When you're sinning, you get guilty, you feel bad. You know, even going to church, I'm sure people who are sinning and realize it, who have the Spirit of God in them, they can sit there and they'll probably feel guilty, they'll feel uncomfortable, you know, until they confess it. And, and, and John tells us, look, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to pretend that you're not sinning in the flesh by saying that God only looks at the Spirit and he's speaking to the agnostics there, you have to literally confess it to the Lord. And God is so faithful to cleanse you and wash you from all your unrighteousness. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so confession there is key. That when we do sin, we confess it before the Lord. We acknowledge it, we agree with God, and then we turn from it and God makes us right again. And then he closes with verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Wow, <laughs> that's an accusation, making God a liar. Now, does God lie? No, he doesn't lie. In fact, um, there's some scriptures that talk about God's very ability to keep his word in fact he says that I can't even swear by anyone else because there's no one higher than me so I can't swear by my mother I can't swear by my father you know because I'm it so I when I speak it it's not a lie it's true and I will make it come to pass but if we say that we don't have sin or we're not sinning why is it that we call him a liar you ever get confronted by someone and they tell you you're in sin and, you, and they tell you, no, no, I'm not sinning, I'm not a sinning, and I'm not a sinner. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, you're calling God a liar because God knows. And you know, which is interesting. And it's that whole, whole concept of how when we offend one another, we offend God. Uh, when we hurt one another, we hurt God. Uh, when we do good to, to others, we do good to God. If we give a cup of water to someone who has need for, for their thirst to be quenched, then we also quench the thirst of our Lord. So somehow we're tied in to God that way. When we live in sin and we tell someone we're not sinning, we call God a liar. And that's quite an accusation. <clears throat> we need to be careful of that. I hate to even end on that note, but let me go back to verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of the things that the world does not understand about Christianity, and, and I totally get it, I mean, it, it is an absolute, I and mean, that's what we proclaim it to be. We, we proclaim Christ to be the only way to heaven, and all other ways, you know, don't lead, lead to heaven. And I, I totally get how that can be so, so offensive, but it is what the Bible teaches, and, and we believe in the Bible. We believe that that book is true, and we believe all the evidence that's out there uh, pertaining to the Bible. There's just so much of it that you just cannot not believe it if we if we did our work and I would rather believe the facts than my emotions and feelings of how unfair that may sound to think that God would send the rest of the world um, to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ but it's what the Bible teaches and every man will stand before God accountable they will because it's been taught all over the place you know all you need is Jesus and if you just embrace Jesus then you're saved and you get to go to heaven and there's no worries about the others but sometimes we we worry about the others more than we worry about the ones that uh, the, the or the truth of the matter um, interesting because governor brown just signed into i guess law he's taking 115 million dollars from the schools 
and he is giving it to make this a sanctioned um, state. So he's taking from all these children so that we won't have to um, give up illegal aliens, which are criminals. It makes no sense. Stuff like that just makes no sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to me either that Jesus, a historical figure with all the evidence of it all, not just biblical historians, but non-biblical historians, secular historians talking about Jesus, this man who walked among us, you know, the dating system based upon his birth. There's so much evidence there, and yet we would rather believe the other stuff because we can't understand how God could destroy everyone else because they didn't believe in Jesus. It's the truth. It's just the truth. And, and I hope that people would at least search it out and, and look at the historical evidence and then make a good conscious choice because it's a matter of their life and death. It's not just ours or others, it's our personal life and death. And John was very clear that Jesus is light and he can't dwell with darkness at all. And in order to dwell with God, we need to take on his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ into our lives. And God gives us that the minute that we give him our lives and we relinquish and surrender ourselves to him. He gives us now his righteousness. And, and all that means is it, it's like if I was a millionaire and, and you said, hey, Reuben, you know, I'm going to trust in you that you're going to take care of my needs. And I go and I put into your account a million dollars. Now you have a million dollars. You are now a millionaire. But you did nothing to receive it. I just gave it. I just put it to you. You're a millionaire. So we're righteous because of Jesus. He just gave it to us because we put our faith and trust you know, in him. So what a deal. <laughs> I think that's a great deal. It's too simple for some people, but it's what the Bible teaches. I encourage you to read your Bible. So we'll finish up 1 John. We'll, we'll look at 2 John this coming Wednesday. Thanks for, for showing up here. God bless you, those in Facebook. Let's pray and wish that the Lord will bless the rest of your day. Father in heaven, we pray your blessings upon your people. We pray, we pray Lord, for those that may be viewing that, that Father, have questions, that have doubts, Lord, <clears throat> that are not sure, Lord. I pray that you answer those things. Uh, Father, that you give them the opportunity to see truly, Lord, without any blinders at all from the enemy or any input from other people, Lord, especially that, Lord. Uh, I pray that they're not people that, that say, well, I heard so-and-so say this. Lord, please, let them search it out themselves, Lord, and, and, and figure it out, Lord, for themselves, and then make a decision based upon what they have found, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Facebook. We'll see you on Wednesday. God bless.